Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles talk show podcast, which is called Things We Said. Ken, hello everyone. Well, let's start off this show by just um, <laughs> making all of our listeners aware of what's been going on with us, because I'm sure that uh, many of you have been wondering what happened to the show. And um, although those of you who follow us on our Facebook page are aware of the fact that um, after our last program, in which we had Jude Kessler as our guest, Steve Marinucci, who co-founded the show with me and has been with the show since the very beginning, decided that he was going to leave the show. And um, he announced that he had certain projects he wanted to work on, including a new book of his own. And he announced this on Facebook. And um, I was kind of surprised that he made this decision. And um, Alan and I got to talking and uh, I was wondering if he wanted to continue doing the show with me and we both decided that we wanted to keep the show going. But I did feel that I would love to get a third co-host for the show, possibly a fourth co-host. And um, so in the past month plus, I've been contacting various people that Alan and I both agreed would be really uh, appropriate for this show that would really fit in very well. In the course of this more than month, a lot of people that I contacted uh, were flattered uh, to be considered, but just about all of them wanted to be guests to appear once in a while and not to be a regular co-host. Fortunately, I was able to find one person so far that wants to be a regular co-host of this show, and I'm going to introduce him to you guys in just a few minutes. So we do have a regular third co-host for the show. And I am hoping, although this is certainly not definite, we might have a fourth co-host to join us, but that may not be until January of next year. So the show will continue, and um, I will have another uh, uh, announcement to make. But uh, before I do that, why don't we welcome our third co-host of the show. And he is no stranger to this program because he's been a guest several times. And... Um, for those of you who are familiar with New York Radio, he's been a fixture on Radio's WFUV for, I believe, it's got to be 35 years now, Darren? Approximately, yeah. 35 years from when I first walked through the door and a little less than that on air. But uh -huh. through a variety of changes starting in 1984 to today, WFUV has been uh, actually, in a way, my first home rather than my home home. Uh, but, uh, yep, it's been over well over 30 years. And take it from two radio people. Anyone that works at the same radio station for more than a few years <laughs> in this business can be a rarity, you know, because jobs come and go, formats come and go. And so for, for Darren to be at the same radio station for that long tells you, you know, how, how highly he's thought of there at the station. And, you know, he's got uh, such a strong fan base at WFEV all these many years. And not only that, but, you know, he's been a good friend of mine for many years. And if you go to the New York uh, Fest for Beatle fans, he's been on many of the panels with me. So and I've always kind of wanted to, to work with him. Kind of. I always did want to work with him. <laughs> so I'm, I'm quite pleased to welcome Darren DeVivo as our regular co-host of this show. Welcome aboard, Darren. And it is a pleasure and an honor to be here to piggyback off what you said. Um, we actually, Ken and I actually talked five years ago about, uh, about stuff. And it just, for many reasons, didn't happen. And that 
stuff ended up being this podcast. So five years l- later, I'm finally on board. And Ken and I have known each other since I think we met in like 1984, possibly. I think. Wow. Was. <laughs> I think 84. I think it was around 84 we met. And uh, and now here we is. It's he also thinks- an honor to be here with Alan, who I've read for many years and uh, and who I know now through guesting on this podcast. And now I look forward to uh, working regularly with. Well, me too. So if it's 1984, it's only taken us 34 years <laughs> <laughs> to work together on a regular basis. But uh, I sure am pleased about that. So um, before we continue with this show, as I just had mentioned before, I have a, an announcement to make, and some of you might be aware of this. But uh, prior to Steve leaving the show, there was um, another program in the works, and I was asked to become a co-host for another another Beatles podcast show. And by the time this show airs, the other new show will also have been posted. And this program will be called, and I love this title, I've always wanted to use this title, Talk More Talk. And it will be a primarily solo Beatles podcast. And I will be joined by Kid O'Toole, for this show and kit's been a regular on this program ken womack who's written a couple of books now on george martin and he was a guest on this show great speaker on the beatles and i've loved his work on uh on those those two george martin books and tom hunyadi who you might know for being a co-host of an all solo paul mccartney podcast called two legs that he's been co-hosting with his cousin, David Gargolino, for a couple of years now. And it was actually Tom that approached me, knowing of my love for the solo Beatles music, to be part of this show. And since Kit has been on Two Legs, and uh, I'm sure Ken Womack has been on that show too, we somehow came together with these four people. And to make this even more interesting, uh, this will be a video podcast and it will air bi-weekly. Uh, the first show uh, is on September the 11th. So like I said, by the time this airs, this show airs, which will probably be the next day or maybe on the Thursday, on the 13th, the video podcast will have aired already. We have a Facebook page where you can watch us online, all four of us, and you can even type in comments as we're doing the show. And the uh, Facebook page is called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. After the show airs live, it's going to stay on the Facebook page. It's also going to be on YouTube. And just like this show, things we said today, we're going to pull the audio from it and it'll go on Podbean. And then from Pod- Podbean, it goes to iTunes. So there's any number of ways that you can hear or watch that show. And the program will air, at least the game plan is, Tuesday nights, 9 p.m. That's Eastern time. The show will be roughly an hour. And like I said, that show will be bi-weekly, hopefully every other Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. And since I just mentioned that that show is bi-weekly, I should also say to all of you folks that things we said today as well will be a bi-weekly show. So um, it would be ideal... (laughs) If uh, one week things we said today airs and the next week talk more talk airs, it may not always be that way. You might get two shows in the same week, but that's um, pretty much, you know, the game plan for now. And I'm pretty excited about the new show and I'm thrilled that Darren's joining us for this show. And who knows what lies up ahead with all the new releases about to come out and the one that we're going to talk about on this show, which just came out from Paul McCartney. It'd be crazy <laughs> not to have this show on with uh, Paul's new album, all the John Lennon stuff revolving around Imagine next month, the White Album remaster in November. So much excitement for the last quarter or four months of 2018. And I'm just glad that we're able to get it back together for this show. And like I said, to have Darren join us as well. You do realize, Ken, that now with the new podcast, you have to shave and comb your hair and look presentable? Well, I'm afraid now, because now people are going to see what I look like, so I might lose 
half of my audience there. Alan and I have no worries here. <laughs> you know. In fact, I'm wearing a dress right now for the first first show, and you don't know that. Well, I told you that. So that's why you're not on the video podcast. <laughs> Hmm. All right, so uh, we're going to be talking about, as you may have guessed, Paul McCartney's new album, Egypt Station. We're going to do that in just a few moments, but we're just going to get to a few news items of the past week or so. No way we can talk about everything that happened in the past month, all of that, in one show, plus review Paul's new album. But first of all, I want to mention that there was a ceremony uh, last Friday on the 7th, the same day that Paul's album came out, to unveil the brand new John Lennon Forever stamp. And it happened at Nomberg Bandshell in Central Park, which is very close to Strawberry Fields. And Dennis Elsis, who uh, certainly Darren knows, working with him at uh, WFUV, <laughs> who's also been uh, you know, a fixture in New York radio for his years at WNEW, who interviewed John in 1974 for Walls and Bridges, very famous interview. He was the MC for the ceremonies, and um, Yoko was there, as was Sean and the photographer Bob Gruen. And Bob took the famous photo. He was the one who took the photo of John for Walls and Bridges, and that's the, what you see on the uh, front cover of Walls and Bridges is what's used on the stamp itself. And um, I have a quote from Yoko, who said, when John died, I said, there will be no funeral. John is going to be forever. And Sean said, my father and mother came to New York as immigrants. He fought very hard to get his green card because he loved this beautiful country and beautiful city. So I happen to have bought the new John Lennon Forever stamp. Did you guys get it? Mine hasn't come yet, but I ordered a set. Okay. I neglected to. I'm going to order it today. I was going to yesterday, but uh, didn't have a chance. So I'll probably get a couple of sheets to collect and perhaps use one sheet's worth of stamps. Mm. It's pretty cool because on one side you've got the, the stamps themselves, and on the back you've got the familiar picture of John at the piano from Imagine that was on the poster for the album. Right. And the very top of it is, is is the shape of a record. So it looks really cool. So uh, obviously, I don't think anyone who's buying these stamps are going to use them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was really nice how it was put together. Suitable for framing. But, but I'm assuming that they they are, I mean, they will be in post offices for, you know, like you know, someone goes in to buy stamps and may very well get, you know, not be much of a fan, but they're usable. They're not just being made for collecting right they're well, regular but stamps who, but, who, but who sends <laughs> yeah. physical letters anymore i know that's the thing I, you don't buy stamps all that often anymore i still <laughs> i'm using christmas stamps and it's uh, <laughs> you know because i bought too many back in december <laughs> well i would imagine no pun intended there that this would be like a, a limited time that this would right. be available so um if you want it i would get it now and you can order it online yeah. It was, uh, is it USPS.com, Alan? Do yes. you know? Yes, I think it okay. is. Okay. And yeah. this is, a, they've recently done Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix come to mind immediately. Of course, Johnny Cash, Elvis has been, you know, so there's, of course, a history with the United States Postal Service of doing uh, musicians uh, on stamps. So mm -hmm. uh, this is, this is, this is a nice, a nice tribute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, another news item here concerns Ringo, and he actually released a brand new recording. There was just a double CD tribute album uh, released for Roger Miller, the legendary country uh, songwriter. He also wrote for Broadway, too. He wrote a Broadway show, right? And uh, he's best known for songs like King of the Road and Dang Me. And um, the tribute CD is called King of the Road, a tribute to Roger Miller. And Ringo recorded one of the songs called Hey, Would You Hold It Down? So that's now available on this brand new compilation. I have heard it. And in fact, I did a whole country set to honor it on uh, my other show, Every Little Thing. It's, uh, it's really an enjoyable song. And Ringo is just so comfortable when it comes to doing country. And it's not the first time that Ringo's recorded a Roger Miller song. Can either of you name the other one? Mm, nope. 
<laughs> Husbands and wives. Very good, Darren. Okay. From the Good Night Vienna album. See, this is why we have Darren on the show. Okay. <laughs> the small detail. <laughs> yeah, the uh, it's a double album. I actually have a copy of the Roger Miller tribute. Uh, I haven't listened to it, though, yet. I haven't had time. But, um, you know, there's a lot of songs and a lot of artists con contributing from all over the music spectrum. So, Right. And Ringo kind of talks his way through the verses and then the chorus he sings. But it's really you know, a very enjoyable song. Um, the other news items that I have really concern uh, Paul McCartney and his new release. For those of you that don't know, Paul was interviewed for the very popular podcast called WTF with Mark Marin. And um, this was done at the Capitol building back around uh, a month or so ago. August 8th. And August the 8th, yeah. And it runs about an hour. It's a very good interview. I have listened to it. What I like most about it is that Paul's just very loose and candid, just saying whatever he feels like. And it's just very comforting you know, and refreshing to hear him that way. Not too much that I haven't heard him say already, but um, still an enjoyable podcast. And um, there's another show, which I haven't heard yet. It's a podcast show called Soda Jerker. And he is on episode 122, which you can listen to online at sodajerker.com. All right. So uh, there's, one other thing. Have... there's one other yeah. thing we should mention. Since we talked about the John Lennon stamps, there is, for people in the New York area or people who know someone in the New York area, there is the Paul McCartney Egypt Station Metro card. Oh, that's oh. right. Yeah. Metro card yeah. for people elsewhere in the country is uh, basically what replaced subway tokens. You get one of these cards, you can fill it and refill it with you know, a certain amount of money and then just swipe it through the turnstile as you go through. And they've done one with the cover of Egypt Station as basically the design for it. Mm -hmm. Very nice it's, idea. Yeah. I don't think it's available at all uh, MetroCard stations. I think the only select ones... I know it's available yeah, like Grand Central. Yeah. I don't know, like, if you're, for example, in at a uh, just a regular subway station in, in the Bronx or Brooklyn, if, you know, they're, they're stocked with the Egypt station card. And I don't think it's going to be available very long. So I'd imagine people are snapping them up as we speak. Yeah. So, anywho. You know, there used to be um, a Paul McCartney Starbucks card. As yes, well. I, yes, that I that <laughs> I do have. Yeah, I have yeah, that definitely. <laughs> and then before that, I believe the first one to get involved with this was Ringo. There was a Ringo Discover card. That, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That had his some of his paintings on. Uh, you could choose from among a couple of his paintings for the design. I think I've got one of those somewhere too. Yeah, that was quite a while ago too. Yep. I think that was around Time Takes Time, around that period, maybe. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. But Paul McCartney certainly knows how to appeal to the collector out there. <laughs> <laughs> he well, keeps them hopping, you know? Yeah, you know, I mean, I got I got something totally by accident um, for Egypt Station that was, um, you know, I got the CD. I got the Target CD because it has two bonus tracks, and the HMV shop in England has the same two bonus tracks, and the Japanese one has the same two bonus tracks, um, which is kind of unusual because Japan usually does something different from everybody else, usually has something extra, so you have to get those two. But I, I ordered a copy of the vinyl. And, Which one? Well, and <laughs> I, I didn't know there were multiple ones, but then my wife ordered a copy of the vinyl for me too. And I was going to keep one sealed and open one to sort of look through at this podcast or for this podcast, you know, to see the lyrics in somewhat bigger printing and, and whatever. And I looked at them and it's, well, wait a minute. We each ordered a completely different edition. There's the double vinyl edition and the strictly limited deluxe edition. Oh. And, there's, and there's various <laughs> colors, too. Yeah. Oh, God. There is the standard black. And I actually found that there's variations to some of these. So I'm a little confused. But there's the standard black. And I think the standard color. Um, now, mind you, Egypt Station's a double LP. So... 
the standard color, I believe one record's orange, the other is blue. By the way, New York Mets colors. <laughs> Just thought of I'd course, throw that out of there. Course, yes. <laughs> uh, but there's also, now let's see if I got this down. I think it's Barnes & Noble yep. has released it as a double... Red. It's red. I was going to say yeah. blue. That's Paul Simon's new album is blue, the Barnes & Noble <laughs> exclusive. But the red is Barnes & Noble, and there is an, an additional uh, exclusive colored, which I believe is somehow tied in with Spotify, that I think is a uh, double orange vinyl or something like that. Now, I've ordered them all, and I have no idea what has arrived yet and hasn't because the packages came yesterday, and I confuse easily as I've gotten older. So... Hmm. Uh, there's all these color variations to to Egypt Station, and I even was reading something this morning where there looked like there was even another standard deluxe. And I don't know. At this point, I thought, all right, I'm going broke. There's a Magic <laughs> box set coming soon, you know. So there's uh, I have enough. Yeah. yeah, I can they, see. I can see the Billboard headline coming. You know, Paul McCartney's new album sells a million copies to four people <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's funny I mean, and then there's the word that you know you just mentioned a deluxe there's supposed to be although it's not definite a deluxe version of egypt station coming out by the end of the year which will have up to 26 songs wow so there's something like another 10 songs to go through <laughs> But he did allude in one uh, interview program that I heard that not that what he was going to be releasing them, but there are considerable amount of songs that didn't fit with what the vibe of Egypt Station was. So but it uh, probably also elaborate packaging and extra stuff like that will entice the collector to buy that if and when it happens. Perhaps he's waiting to see how initial sales and the initial reaction to the album will be. Yeah, hmm. it's, it's pretty much always the case with him, ex except for the very first couple of albums. Um, he's he's always got at least another album's worth of stuff that he hasn't put out. Um, you know, Red Rose Speedway was going to be a double album. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, you know, Flowers in the Dirt sort of became a double album in Japan when they put out a, a second fully packed disc of B-sides and, and related things. Mm -hmm. So... Same with Off the Ground, too. There's a mm -hmm. double that right. came out in some country, yeah. like Off the Ground, the complete mm -hmm. works or something like that, that has all of the, the, the non-album singles and uh, and maybe even some additional stuff. But I look forward to hearing, uh, of course, we all do, all of the extra songs, but there's a reason why you got to be careful. There's a reason why they were left off the main album in the first place, so... Well, it's a whole other show here, but in some of Paul's best work are songs he didn't put on his albums. They're either B-sides or they're bonus tracks on CD singles. Right. You know, especially with Off the Ground, since you were yep. bringing that one up. Yep, yep, yep. Even but Flowers. Anyway. Even Flowers. I mean, I thought yep. Flying to My Home was immensely better than Ue Le Soleil. I mean, come on, <laughs> give me a break. Yes, I You're I always agree, picking yeah. on that song. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know, yeah. because it's, you know. No. What I remember about the uh, Flowers in the Dirt was that I spent a considerable amount of money to get the Japanese, I don't know if it was two discs or three CDs, probably just two. It was two, I think. And ultimately, when I looked at it, I realized I had just spent, you know, in the vicinity of $100 for P.S. Love Me Do, <laughs> which was the only track that I didn't already have somewhere else amongst Flowers in the Dirt releases. So that always kind of, I always think about that, that I spent for one song about $100-ish. That's part that of the is. reason why, why I wanted to have you on this show, to show how much of a fan you are. <laughs> Some might and, put me in the category of needing, you know, medical <laughs> attention, but, and, I, and I see, I, as I speak about these things, I think, you know, when my wife listens, and this stuff is all over our house, mm. you know, it's like, oh. So, you know, this is all the stuff that's in every room of my house, huh? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> All right. So why don't we get to the main topic here, which is Paul's new album called Egypt Station, his first new studio album in five years since new. And before we talk about individual tracks, I just want to bring up this one point, uh, which Paul has said in many of his interviews, probably most of them, that he wanted this album to be more of something closer to a concept album. And he was just relating to the fact that today albums are more like a bunch of singles, not necessarily songs that are threaded together that make sense in some way. And relating back to an album like Sgt. Pepper, how it was done back then. And other than the fact that he was envisioning train stops and the whole idea behind Egypt Station was that it was a painting that, that Paul made, I believe, in 1999. And he thought maybe as you're going through each song, it might be as though you're going to different train stops or something like that. When I listen to this album, I don't feel like it's a concept album at all. Do any of you feel that it is? Darren? I don't. I don't. Uh, 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 no, I uh, uh, thematically, no, the songs have not. They're not linked whatsoever. But at the same time. He does sort of structure the album with uh, uh, it's uh, with the very brief two of them. I think the album could have used a third one. Little interludes. The album opens uh, with opening station, which is like 42 seconds of of just ambiance uh, mm -hmm. sounding like you're in a train station that kind of morphs into some sort of dream state. And then towards the end of the album comes station two, which is only slightly longer than the first and again, reminds you that you are traveling to a station. It kind of gets lost by the time Station 2 rolls around that you started out with, you know, train station sound. So there could have probably have been one in the middle, like a mid-album interlude, uh, maybe a little longer. But it, also the way he structures the album, it reminded me slightly like Band on the Run. The songs weren't linked, but... The way Band on the Run had an, uh, the conclusion, the reprise of the title song tagged uh -huh. on at the end. This album also sort of builds towards this climax of two six plus minute long suites or medleys that are waiting for you at the end. And I found that the sec center of the album seemed, the, you know, uh, melodically to be similar. So I could sort of see where sonically he built a bit of a th thematic album but the songs the concept in the classic sense of a concept album it, it's it's not it's meant to be you, you really should listen to it from beginning to end that type of concept album this is mm. yeah paul said he wanted to create an album that you would listen to from start to finish it's, I listen to all of Paul's albums that way, so I don't see what the what the difference is here. But, well, I uh, mean, the 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 younger ear today does not treat albums anywhere near right the way we did when we were younger. The album, in that sense, it, I wouldn't hesitate to say it's dead, but it doesn't mean what it meant. And I think Paul's trying with this album to say. Yeah, but once upon a time, this is the way you listen to an album. Yeah, you, you could have a couple of favorite songs and a couple of hit singles, but it's supposed to be experienced within the context of the other songs mm -hmm. and not just be these random tracks thrown up against a wall or like the younger listeners do today. They don't pay close attention to the album. They are more concerned with, you know, the hit that that's getting that that right now and if there's another song on the album they'll get that one tune and not worry about the whole concept mm -hmm. uh, idea yeah alan what are your thoughts on this yeah i don't really see it as a concept album in the sense that in a you know concept album theoretically everything is related and tied to a theme of some kind and in that sense really Almost all the big concept albums are not really concept albums. Pepper's not really a concept album. Mm -hmm. um, Smile isn't really a concept album. Uh, it, it, it starts out as one, but it never quite gets there. Um, in this case, what it seems to me is that he has adopted in a certain way the pattern that is established in Sgt. Pepper in that opening station even though it's really just ambience and and a little more than that i mean it does have that really nice choral ending that 
leads into the piano intro of I don't know. Um, and then, but it, but it's kind of like that's as if it's Sergeant Pepper and Station Two is as if it's Sergeant Pepper reprise and goes directly into a last track that is sort of outside the supposed cycle, I guess. You know, if you think of Sergeant Pepper uh, saying, you know, they're they're saying goodbye at the end and then they go into a day in the life. Um, mm-hmm. Now here they go into Hunt You Down Naked Sea Link and if you get the target one, you get two more. Um, but it's kind of that same structural pattern. Uh, otherwise, I think it can be seen as kind of a concept album in the sense that all of these songs seem to be things that Paul has on his mind. I mean, they're not just, they're, they're, there's a little bit and perhaps a little too much of the, oh, come on, baby kind of thing. Um, but even those, I mean, these these are all sort of, in a way, topic songs, you know, and we'll go through them individually, I guess. But, you know, you've got Who Cares About Bullying, and you've got, you know, Come On To Me, which at the moment is kind of an interesting song to put out there in the middle of the Me Too thing, you know, because he's, he's, it's as if he's saying, uh, you know, but, but wait, people still are attracted to each other and there's still this dance that goes on and that's what this is, mm-hmm. um, you know, and Confidant is something else. And, it, you know, each, each one is kind of a discreet thing that Paul seems to have on his mind and wants to explore in a song. And so you could think of it as a concept album in that way. I mean, unlike, say, Driving Rain, we don't have any songs where he's counting. Um, (laughs) As opposed to, I mean, they all basically have lyrics that tell a story. And uh, so there's that. Okay. All right. Um, So why don't we just get an overview from each of you of what you think of this album and then we'll we'll pinpoint certain songs and what we think are the best or uh most worthwhile ones from the album and darren why don't you start i like this album a lot uh i hesitate to say it is a great album it could grow on me a little more but basically i think it jumps out of the box very strong meanders unfortunately a little too long in the middle and then gets interesting again with the uh, uh, lengthy medleys or suites that are at the end of the album. While I was listening to it, I was sort of, I kept thinking that in a way it reminded me of London Town in so much that London Town had a lot on it. It was a long album for its time. I think it was in in excess of, for a single album, in excess of 50 minutes, which was a little long back then, unless you went into a double uh, 50 minutes is a decent amount of music, uh, perhaps too much to put on a, a vinyl LP. And you could make an argument that there were some things on London Town that maybe could have been left off, and it could have been a case of less is more with that album. I sort of feel that way about Egypt Station. There's a couple of things on here that I think could have been left off, and I think the album overall would have been stronger. But all is said and done as a listen, as a sit down, getting back to what we were saying about the concept, as a sit down and listen from beginning to end. It's quite a good album. I think it is considerably better than new. And I think it's very well produced. It sounds great. Mm -hmm. It sounds great loud and it sounds great in the headphones. There's a lot of good presence to the instrumentation. Paul's bass playing is, uh, is terrific. I wish they were a little more detail-oriented in the notes on who plays on each individual track. I was going to say that, too, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious who the, who's doing the drumming. Some songs you could tell it's probably Abe Laboriel Jr. And then there's other instances I'm like, that sounds like Paul would be drumming. The mm-hmm. drums are really uh, are, are treated nicely in the, in, in the mix up front. So uh, all told, I'm happy. Uh, and I, but it still needs a couple of listens. That middle middle part of the album kind of I think meanders a bit, and maybe some of those songs might jump out at me in the future. But you know, once you get to the middle of the album, it, you know, it's you can get up and walk away for a little bit and come back, and you haven't missed all that much. Right. 
I agree with you about the uh, musicians' credits because since Paul is someone who can play any instrument, and you know there are times when he's played all the instruments on certain songs of his, and even a few of his albums, you know he could easily have played all the instruments on certain songs on this album. You'd like to think that he's using his touring band on just about every single song. I would like to think that's how it is, but we don't really know for sure. Um, there are times, because you, if you know Paul's style as a drummer, it's very simple, but he's got a groove going. And something like Naked, for example, sounds like something he would be playing. But I wish we weren't guessing about it. I wish it would mm -hmm. all be laid out um, in that regard. Alan, how about you as an overview? Yeah, um, my overview is very similar to Darren's. Um, I do think there are parts in the middle that begin to just sort of be there. You know, the the record is on. You're not really uh, drawn into it quite so much. And, and, and that's listening to it even trying to be drawn into it because I'm going to have to talk about it, right? You know, so I want to mm -hmm. hear what's going on. But, you know, there are parts of it that kind of wash over you. Um, and, and perhaps, uh, ironically, in a way, maybe with those songs, uh, the way I could come a bit more to terms with them is to sort of forget that it's an album and just listen to the individual track and focus on that um mm. you know but generally speaking uh i i agree that it's uh i think a better album than new and a better album than quite a number of his albums actually and i think part of that is that the production really is so good i mean the guitars when he wants them to be crunchy or crunchy and um the the playing is all very good very tight and it just has a it, it has a very thoughtfully produced sound that I, I think a lot of his other albums to me sounds a little more diffuse than this does but this hangs together well uh all the tracks seem to be the same person in a way i mean i know that's that uh, maybe i have to explain what i mean by that i mean there are certain of his albums where as you go from track to track it's as if he is putting on a different persona to be in the next song and then a third persona for the song after that but this all seems to be sort of a unified vision and that appeals to me mm. um, but i also like a lot of the songs um i think it was good to open the album apart from opening station i think it was good to open it with i don't know which of the three songs he had put out before this album release um, was struck me as the best of them uh, and it comes out of because of the piano intro, and which when we talk, when we talked about the first single, um, I was very struck by the the piano playing on it, and he has that piano playing coming out of the choral writing, which appeals to me a lot. It it just seems to work really well, just as he has the sort of crunchy guitar coming out of Station Two, um, and then sort of coming out full force in Hunt You Down, Naked, Sea Link. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of like those little touches. And a lot of the songs I, I really like too. I mean, they're, they're um, I think, more thoughtfully put together than sometimes his songs are you know i mean he he always talks about this business of you know well john and i always said if we couldn't write a song in two hours we would that you know that was the time we were giving ourselves and you know that's that doesn't work you know <laughs> um and sometimes it sounds it i mean when you have an album where where you have a song and the lyrics are one two three four five let's go for a drive six seven eight nine ten let's go there and back again you kind of know that he ran out of time at the end of the two hours and didn't come up with actual lines. You um, see, Darren, he's <laughs> going to keep picking on this song and Uwe Le Soleil. And as we're getting closer to Christmas. Well, yeah, wonderful Christmas time. Is coming. <laughs> I'm just preparing you for this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and there, yeah, there, there, 
there are some songs I like more than others. There's uh, Happy With You, I think, um, I, I thought was a little bit cringeworthy. Uh, you know, I used to I used to get high a lot, but now I don't because I'm happy with you. I mean, I don't know, he was pretty happy with Linda, and he was high all the time, right? So, I don't know. It doesn't work for me. But hmm. uh, most of the things, I, most of these songs, I think, are actually really pretty good. And, and as a whole, as a listening experience, putting on the album, even though there are some you know, slight doldrums in the middle. Uh, I think it's still a a nice listening experience top to bottom. And uh, the last time I've listened to it, maybe five or six times now. And the last time when it ended, I thought, well, that, that seemed awfully fast and it shouldn't have seemed awfully fast because there's 18 tracks on the, on the target one, but it, it, it seemed to be going by faster. And I think that, uh, I think it is growing on me a bit. Hmm. So that's that. Okay. All right. Well, with me, I just want to say that um, I am certainly glad that I didn't write something on Facebook after one listen to this album, because I wasn't too impressed the first time I heard uh, this album, although there were certain songs that leapt at me as ones that I knew I would like instantly. By the third or fourth listen, I was really into this album and it gets better with every listen to me like you were saying alan i've now listened to it six times i really love the production behind it i notice a lot of acoustic guitar in particular on this album and um the sound of the keyboards very bright very contemporary sounding and i like so much about about uh the sequencing of the songs i didn't feel like the middle of the album that it slowed down in any way I think that most of the songs are fairly strong. And just like so many of Paul's albums, there's a lot of variety here. And you can tell that there are certain songs that he probably worked on and put a lot more effort behind. And certain songs like Caesar Rock, which are you know pretty much songs that he made up in the studio and was very spontaneous. And some people like that approach. Mm-hmm. And you get to hear both sides of Paul that way. Songs that he worked on quite a bit, songs that he that are just like a loose jam. In many ways, when I think of what he has said about Caesar Rock, it kind of reminds me of the approach that was used for Electric Arguments, which is to create a song in the studio from scratch, come up with something in a day. you know. And once in a while, he will do something like that. And I love the fact that, well, like most McCartney albums, you've got softer songs and you've got rockers. You've got songs where his voice, it's very noticeable how it's aged. You've got songs where he's screaming and he sounds like, you know, he's he's still a rocker and he's still got that voice to some degree. You know, especially on a song like Hunt You Down, uh, for example. So there's so many, there's, there's so much to say about this album and uh, one thing that i always try to adhere to and i know a lot of people will probably don't want to hear me say this is that it's very tough to judge an album on just a few days and um like i said i've listened to this now about six times there are some people i know who will judge an album after one or two listens i don't know how anybody can possibly do that um i like to take about a month before i really give a review which would probably be much more accurate because you've had more time to listen to it. You've had more time to distance yourself from it, take a breather from it, then go back to it. And I think that's a much more realistic review when you do something like that. In the very beginning, there are certain songs that are going to be stuck in your head and you're going to be thinking some of these songs are the greatest songs you ever heard, or they might be some of your favorites. A month later, eh, maybe you may not feel the same way. So, but I can tell you that I'm very impressed with the variety on this album. I do love his voice. I've come to terms with the fact that he's not the same guy as he was in the 60s and 70s with that incredibly powerful voice. But like I said, there are those moments when he could scream like the best of them. And then, um, you know, overall, I'm very impressed without saying, and, and I hate when people automatically say, it's his best album since, dot, 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 you know, The Beatles or Bed on the Run or Tug of War. I'm not going to say anything like that. I'm going to wait a while before I actually make an assessment like that. But I am very impressed by what I've heard. And like I said, it's, it's, 
it grows on you with every listen. At least it has for me. Yeah, it would be interesting if we did like, um, I'm not saying we will do this, but in six months, you know, like Egypt Station revisited show and see where we're at with the album, like you said, in six months, because I do anticipate my opinions uh, changing a bit. I could tell you right now that when I Don't Know and Come On To Me were initially released as the new quote unquote single, I don't know. I needed a couple of listens. Mm -hmm. so I started to warm up to it. It started to become a song that was very familiar. It had that warmth to it, and it had that the piano part probably was what did it. It seemed to be an amalgamation of a bunch of things McCartney's done in the past that I've liked. And to with listening to it within the concept of Egypt Station, I realized it's a great song. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel that way about I Don't Know the first time I heard it. It's a great song. I was it the same really, way. Yeah. You know. Uh, so, you know, it is it, it, it is a lot. Lyrically, it's a little, I think you can make the general, and I think Alan probably would agree with this, you could make the generalization that lyrically, as a whole, Egypt Station is uh, lightweight. I would like a little more substance to the lyrics. But yet at the same time, the album has a lot happening in there and there's a lot to dissect and it isn't a simple album. So yeah, it's it, 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 still kind of like, I agree with you, Ken, you got to hold back on a final assessment. It's too soon. You know, this is the, you know, we're recording this on the third day that the album has been available, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I'll admit I haven't had a chance to listen to the two extra songs on the, on the deluxe edition yet. And I've heard that, uh, one of them, at least, is good enough that it could probably have replaced one of the tracks in the middle of the album. So, But I haven't heard yet. It's just go, I'm going by something I read. Yeah. I just want to say I agree with you about I Don't Know. I had the same reaction. And it's rare when a McCartney ballad takes a while to grow on me. I usually like a McCartney ballad or a love song in one or two listens. But, um, you know, it just didn't grip me that quickly the first time that the first or second time that i heard it but now i think i don't know is is really a great song you know what you know what uh, i keep going back to an album that's kind of a lightning rod i think uh, amongst mccartney aficionados and that's driving rain which i like a lot uh, mm -hmm. but the uh the um i'm drawing a blank on the opening opening song the lonely title. road, lonely well, no, road. No, no, the first single what was the that oh, i guess from, from a lover to a friend that was one that I took me ages to warm up to. And then all of a sudden I put the, I put it on one day and I was like, this, you know, I get, I got, I get it. This is a great song. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it. It seemed kind of like an odd, odd tune to me. It took time. And suddenly I heard that song in a different light for some reason. Right. Well, a lot of songs are like that from a lover to a friend. The chorus of that song is just, it's simple, but it's so strong. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah. So why don't you uh, walk with me, Darren, through a few of the songs that you would highlight as your favorites and why? OK, I would say my favorites bookend the album. I don't know for what the same reason for what I just said, basically. I think it's a classic McCartney piano ballad, but one that needed, at least in this instance, several listens. Hmm. I would say that. The uh, three song medley at the end of the standard edition, Hunt You Down, Naked, Sea Link, is my other pick for best track on the album. Uh, I think McCartney's a genius when it comes to these medleys in most instances. Mm. And uh, these three songs just, uh, they just work nice together. Uh, Hunt You Down reminded me uh, a lot of the world tonight. Hmm from uh flaming pie okay uh naked slows it down a little bit and then sea link is basically a blues jam with paul on lead simple but taste tasteful uh guitar playing and uh i also like uh i mean come on to me is a very catchy typical of the albums paul's been putting out in recent years it's got that very simple but punchy and incredibly catchy single for first focus track mm -hmm. um fine line 
uh, from chaos and creation in the backyard and uh, help me here. Memory Almost Full's first uh, focus track was... Uh, Ever Present Past. Right. Mm-hmm. And and I think Come On To Me, in a way, is that type song on Egypt Station. I like, um, I like Who Cares. I'm not nuts about the sentiment writing a song about bullying. Eh. But I think as a song, it's a solid rock song, and it's, it's a highlight for me. I would pick those as my, my favorites. And on a handful of listenings, I still don't know what to make out of Back in Brazil. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Do It Now is the low point of the album. Wow. <laughs> Do It what? Now, to me, is like, put it there. It's like, fluff. <laughs> it is, exactly. And at that point, I realized when I looked, I'm like, all right, one, two, three, four, fives. He's actually on a string of about anywhere from four to six tracks that haven't grabbed me. Maybe this album is going to fall into it's a disappointment. And then the last few medleys really picked it up for me and I think saved the album. But like we've said a few times, check in with me in a few months and I may think that Do It Now is okay. Uh, right. But ultimately, I think that's the weakest part of the album. Maybe um, when they put out the Super Deluxe Edition with the 10 extra tracks, we can revisit the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> It'll but probably see... completely change depending on how it's all packaged. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could very well change the how the way we feel, you know. I know uh, about the album. Another song, Dominoes, is one that I've heard mm. people say, oh, I love it. It's a highlight. Yeah. To me, it was just another song in the middle of the album that didn't really distinguish itself okay. hand in hand as well. Anyway. Well, this is why I say it's so difficult to judge an album so soon. But anyway, Alan, how about you? Yeah, I'm beginning to think that um, Darren and I are like separated at birth in a way because <laughs> my uh, I also have run into lots of comments about how Domino is one of the highlights of the album and it hasn't really done anything for me um do it now i don't think i dislike as much as 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 darren does but um but again it it seems to be a little formulaic in the sense that like you know this and put it there we are running through the jim mccartney sayings that have become (laughs) songs i think you know we really should mention um despite repeated warnings because mm-hmm. uh, despite repeated warnings, is it's it's a really interesting song. Um, yeah, this is, you know, we'd been hearing for months that he recorded a song about you know Trump and the whole thing. Uh, he in his comments about this song, he has sort of soft pedaled that aspect of it, perhaps because he doesn't want to offend some of his listeners and so he's talked about you know there are some leaders out there that question climate change and he's cast the song basically as being particularly about climate change which i guess it is i mean you read through the lyrics and it it sustains that i think it's interesting that what he did with this is he tried to make it a little bit metaphorical you know they're on a ship heading for an iceberg and the captain isn't listening to anybody and you know so you you can see what's going on if you you know whichever of the interpretations you want to use um i i think it works pretty well i think that the sort of musical changes that occur in the course of it work out pretty well too you know it's a it's a long song 658 Back in Brazil, also, you know, like Darren, I I haven't been knocked out by it, but um, don't dislike it especially. But um, for collectors out there, you should know that he apparently made a promo for that song for airing in Brazil only. So you got to find someone in Brazil to send you a copy. (laughs) Uh, But... (laughs) Uh, I haven't been able to uh, get my hands on that yet, but um, okay. So other songs on the album. I mean, I, I I already had said that I like I don't know a lot, and um, mm-hmm. it's it's kind of surprising um, that Ken that it, it you you felt that it was a, a slow you know burn to sort of you know get mm-hmm. get grabbed by it. I, it, it 
grabbed me immediately, but that could just be because of the piano line. I mean, I tend to focus on that kind of detail, and if there's something in that I like, uh, unless it just goes someplace, you know, off the rails, uh, it, it, it seems like a, a, a good start to me. And it reminds me, like Darren said, of a bunch of other things he did. In this case, in particular, Beautiful Night. There are certain turns. Oh, yeah. In, yeah, very good example. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, there are certain turns in the melody that just seem mm -hmm. to hint at the melody of Beautiful Night uh, and the feeling of it, too. Come on to me. Um, you know, a lot of people really dislike it. I don't dislike it that much. I, I, I think it's a, a kind of fun rocker. I think um, there's something that I think Ken said when we were talking generally about, uh, well, actually not even about the album, but you were talking about the Mark Marin interview and yeah. how loose and candid he is. I, I, loose and candid seem to be, to me, good descriptions of the album as a whole you know and come on to me has that for you has that although there's the little questionable twist of you know what is he really saying and he's mm -hmm. saying for you okay fine so he is but you know it just seems i don't know it seems not it would be too much to say juvenile but it just doesn't seem the joke doesn't seem worth it you know what i mean um, you have to, i, I thought you hadn't mm. come on to me on the album. You didn't need for you. They're sort of cut from the same yeah. cloth in a way. Mm -hmm. Now, Confidant, I um, mm. you know, I, th I think we also we haven't mentioned in the show that Paul has this whole series of short clips uh, yeah. on, on YouTube where he explains what some of these songs are. And I got to say, uh, without that, I wouldn't know what to make of Confidant because you listen to Confidant and you think he is addressing a person, you know, a former girlfriend or whatever, you know, I, I fell out of love with you in the Rome and I ended the romance. But then he goes on to say, you stood by me while all my so-called friends didn't. So, you know, which, which is it? I mean, is he regretting giving up this relationship? What is it? Well, it turns out that it's a song to a particular Martin guitar that he used to have, standing in the corner and he would pick up and play when you know he walked into the room and wanted to do something there's no way that you would know that from the song you, you have to hear his explanation of it when you hear the explanation of it suddenly the song makes some sense but i don't know what people just listening to the album are supposed to make of it if not for you know that comment that isn't included in the album and there are no liner notes explaining anything so don't know what to make but you know there's a lot of great songs out there that could be interpreted you know as having different meanings like like we've talked about here on the show about george harrison songs that you thought might have been about a woman could be about god right but and they work those songs work both ways this song doesn't work if it's talking to a woman because you can't tell whether you know he can't you know i i ended the romance you were really great. You stood behind me. You know, it it kind of is saying two contradictory things that to me doesn't make a lot of sense in a song hmm. without some kind of explanation. You know, it could okay. be you could you could have it be about a woman but have a verse that somehow explains, you know, that he regrets making this decision or something, you know, but but that isn't there. So it really only works as the guitar song, but it's kind of not explained. Let's see what else do it now. Caesar Rock. Caesar Rock. Um, it's another one of those that just sort of goes by me. And um, who cares? Yeah, I did like who cares more than Darren did. Um, because, yeah, bullying may not be uh, a sexy topic in a way, but it is a topic that is out there now. I mean, there, there are a lot of people who who feel sort of oppressed by this, especially because of the internet and the uh, ability for, that people have now to sort of, you know, just go on and troll people and, and, and say horrible things. Um, sometimes very powerful people do this too. <laughs> um, 
and you know and he's basically and he's basically saying and this is uh, where the loose and candid thing i think comes in too you know who cares what the idiots say you know and then on the other hand who who cares how you feel i do i i think it's a nice sentiment um and the music for it is is pretty good too i think it works uh, it works very good live he it was one mm-hmm. of the yeah here is hearing him do it at, at uh, Grand Central Station uh, on the uh, video feed. Uh, that's when I the song appealed to me. Yeah, it didn't jump out at me when I first heard the album. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in hand in hand is just kind of nice. Um, didn't really do it for me either way, but I didn't hate it. You know, I think that's one that if I start if I listen to it separately a few more times, it might grow on me a bit more. Uh, so I, I think that's you know a, a reasonably full overview for me. The only other thing that I would add is that, well, you know, Ken, you're you're right that there are some screamers on here where he really does his Paul McCartney rock voice and it works. I think generally speaking, he has written these songs for his voice as it is now. You know, so mm-hmm. uh, you know, come on to me is pretty much it's pretty talky really i mean it's it's it has a little bit of a tune but it it doesn't take him very far in the range and i think in a lot of these songs he has kept in mind what his range is what the best parts of his range are what he's comfortable singing and that's what he's written for and that's you know that's actually what a professional songwriter does you know yeah. you're, you're right for the person who's going to be singing it and in his case it's him so yeah i just wanted to I, mention that about the voice i think he sounds better on this album than he did on new mm-hmm. new he sounded on some of those songs he sounded old he doesn't ne- necessarily sound as old overall on egypt station mm-hmm I'd have to think about that. I mean, there are certain songs like Early Days, where in particular his voice was ragged and the producer at the time said, leave it that way. Right. You know, because it might show emotion in his voice or, you know, I'd have to think about that. But I, I definitely agree with you, Alan. He's, he's writing these songs to suit his voice, his vocal range now. Although we're talking about screaming, one of the two bonus tracks from Target um, is a song called Get Started. Mm-hmm. And you should check out the end of that song because he does some really powerful screaming at That's the end true, yeah. that you probably think he wasn't capable of. Mm-hmm. And um, the other uh, bonus track called Nothing for Free, his voice is pretty high up there in range. So, um, you know, I, I do wonder what he's capable of. Maybe, uh, you know, on certain days he can handle, a, you know, a higher, a, a higher uh, vocal line. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But... Um, Probably in a controlled environment, it's easier for him also to have some flexibility with his voice as opposed to being on stage having to compete with amplified, you know, instruments where that's where you hear the age. Mm -hmm. What are your takes on those, both of you, the two the two songs being that I haven't had the opportunity to listen to them? I like them both a lot. In fact, I think they really deserve to be on the album to begin with. In fact, nothing for free. There are certain songs that if Paul McCartney was getting played on Top 40 Radio today would be hits. Mm -hmm. And nothing for free is another song, by the way, which he co-wrote with Ryan Tedder. And he co-wrote for you with Ryan as well. But it really has a very contemporary sound to it. And... You know, this is a, a whole other topic altogether, but uh, we've talked about this before on past shows. But Paul McCartney could put out a song right now that could be a hit easily if the top 40 stations of today would play him. But they're not going to play a guy who's 76 years old. And they're trying to appeal to a younger demographic audience who they feel are not going to go and buy music from someone that age. And it's not just Paul McCartney. It's anybody who's a veteran rock star. You're not going to get even, you know, the Elton Johns and Eric Clapton's of the world to get airplay on that format of radio. Doesn't mean the music isn't good enough to be played. It's just that they choose not to play it because they feel that their audience wouldn't want to listen to an aging rock star. And it's irrelevant how good the song is. It's the same thing with For You, 
which is a song that I don't really mind at all. Um, I know there was so much controversy around the song, and that, I believe, was all intentional anyway. For You is a song that's catchy as hell, sounds very contemporary, and I love how catchy it is. I love the sound of it. I love the production of it. I love the strings, how it's used in the song, but I just don't like the gimmickry of it. That's mm -hmm. the only thing that, that put me off to the song. And everybody, all the the really knowledgeable Beatle fans, you know, the history of Apple Records brought up King of Fa <laughs> yeah. by Brute Force, how similar that is. But you know that even though Paul is saying, I just want it for you, or for you, it doesn't sound like that to people who don't look up the lyrics. And that, that was done so that people would be shocked and get people talking. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It worked. It may have backfired in some ways because some people were t really turned off that Paul would do something like that. It's a fun song. I know he was having fun with it, but it does sound contemporary. And it's, it's like so many songs that Paul has done in recent years that should have been hits, would have been hits if it was the 1970s and Top 40 was playing in them, or even to some degree the 1980s. And Fa You is one of those songs. Nothing for free, if you do get to hear that one, is a song that would work very well. I think it would be a hit today. Get Started, by the way, the other bonus track from Target, really has like a, a 70s wings feel to it. And when um, the new album came out, the, the deluxe version, there was a bonus track on there called Turned Out. And when you listen to that song, it sounds like a wing song. <laughs> it really has a 70s feel to it. And I kind of feel that way about Get Started. And like I said, really powerful screaming vocals at the end from Paul mm -hmm. during Get Started there. So uh, but what did you think of those two songs, Alan? Yeah, um, I've only heard them at this point a couple of times, and neither of them really grabbed me that strongly, um, but I, I see what you say about them, and uh, you know, Get Started does have the, that, that sort of rocking ending, which was kind of nice. I, I'd have to hear them a few more times to have that much to say, but there's something else interesting about it. You know, when you say... Uh, what that one of them sounds like a Wings song. Um, there are certain tracks on this album that made me think a little bit of uh, Fireman, you know? So there, there's certain referencing that he does throughout the album to previous stuff he did, and I don't know whether it's, you know, conscious referencing or it's these are just his thumbprints because it's he's the same guy, you know? Mm -hmm. But there is one other thing I wanted to say about Despite Repeated Warnings, which is if you, every time I listen to it, for some reason, maybe because of the slow piano chords, descending figure, it reminds me of something that could have been on Procol Harum Shine on Brightly. Wow. Huh. You know, next time when you when we finish this if you guys listen to it I'd be curious if you if you get that impression too. Mm. Uh, I haven't listened to that album in a long time, but uh, that is a uh, an interesting observation. A couple of uh, random things um you were just talking about for you and you know, listening to it, it it, it seemed to me it, it, it probably was influenced by Paul's work uh, with Kanye West. It's it, it has that very, as you mentioned, Ken, contemporary feel to it. And even the way the song bounces along, I don't know what it was. It just struck me as probably having been influenced from associating with a contemporary artist like Kanye West. What we haven't touched on is Greg Kirsten, who is the main producer of the album. If you read into the particulars in the, in the liner notes, Greg produced the album. Uh, it mentions Paul as the co-producer. And then there are the two tracks which were produced by Ryan Tedder and Zach Skelton. And I didn't know that Ryan Tedder was a member of One Republic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that further uh, that extends McCartney's tendency in recent years to working with younger musicians. That was the case with new working with Kanye West. And now here 
there's a guy from One Republic whose fingerprints are on the album, Egypt Station. But Kirsten's an inst- interesting guy who I interviewed a number of years ago at WFUV. He initially was in a band called Geggy Ta, who we played a bit on FUV. And then the first project of his that really appealed to me was this, what it turned out to be a one-off band, Action Figure Party. They did one self-titled album, and uh, which I loved. It came out probably in the ballpark of 15 years ago or so. And from there, Greg then became uh, one half of The Bird and the Bee, which was kind of a uh, kitschy pop duo. The other half was Inara George, who was Lowell George's daughter, was the vocalist in The Bird and the Bee. And, uh, and of course, Greg producing other people from Beck and was briefly considered a member of The Shins. And uh, I don't have the list in front of me, but Beck is just... Uh, scratching the surface of people that uh, Greg has worked with in recent years and brings us up to uh, working with McCartney here on Egypt Station. And and Greg uh, does a nice job, as uh, we mentioned earlier, with the production of this album. Mm. Well, if I could, I'd like to bring up a few of the songs that are favorites of mine. I Don't Know is really emerged as uh, a great song in my mind. I do love the sound of that piano and just the sparseness of it in the very beginning. And how it comes back later in the song. It's just very cleverly done. And I also, you know, a lot is said about Paul's voice these days. Sometimes when there's a strain in Paul's voice, it brings some character to the song as well. And I, I definitely feel that way about what that added to that song. It's really a beautiful melody and a great arrangement. I do love Come On To Me. I love it because there's such an edginess to it. It's catchy as hell. It's one of those songs that you listen to once and you remember how it goes. But I especially love the horn section. Um, The Muscle Shoals horns were used on that song. And in particular, I, I didn't bring this up before, but that guitar part that Brian Ray plays, which has like an electric sitar sound, mm-hmm. really adds a lot to that. It's one of my favorite moments in that song. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I-, I love Come On To Me. I really do. Confidant is a favorite of mine. Um, it's just a very strong acoustic song. And I think it's very clever that he wrote that about his guitar. And when you do pay attention to the lyrics, it makes perfect sense that his guitar has been with him all these many years. And he shared so much of his, you know, secrets, his secret thoughts in his songs and did it through his guitar. And so I just I think it's a very clever song in that way. Hand in Hand, unlike you, Alan, is an absolute highlight for me. I think it's such a gem. It's one of those two and a half minute songs that Paul wrote that's absolutely beautiful, which I can actually see as uh, like a wedding song. And if if a song like that had been on, say, the White Album all these years, it would be a classic. It definitely would. Paul has the knack of writing these really nice love songs, some of them very short. And uh, this one, adding strings to it, and also a flute. Although I'm not even sure sometimes when you hear a flute sound, if that's really from the synthesizer, if Wix is playing it or not. But Hand in Hand is really a gorgeous song. I definitely think that is a standout. And if more people were aware of it, 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 it should become a classic, in my in my personal opinion here. Yeah, just to have the piano and the strings and the flutes. I also love dominoes a lot. I just like the way the melody flows and how it goes from, you know, the verses to the chorus. Again, there's a lot of very acoustic-driven songs here on, on, on this album. And if you think back to, there are certain albums like London Town, which is very you know, acoustic based, maybe, you know, at times you might want to think that this album is similar to that. Unlike you, Alan, and uh, you, Darren, Do It Now is one of my favorites. It Hmm. has a really great melody. And I do like the fact that uh, unlike you, Alan, you know, he uses a phrase that his father used to say to him. It's kind of a way of keeping his memory alive through the music, just like we put it there. And, uh, you know, the, the whole song, it's a very simple idea about doing what you're thinking of doing in the present instead of letting time slide by. And I love the harmonies and the string arrangement of Do It Now. I think it's a very powerful song. 
Despite Repeated Warnings is one of the few songs that I still, it hasn't grown on me yet. Hmm. You know, I love hearing it, you know, as I'm listening to it. But even after six listens, I couldn't tell you how it goes. So I'd have to really listen more and more to it. And I love the medley of Hunt You Down Naked and Ceiling. Paul has that gift of putting together these medleys. The only problem I have with this one is that I love Hunt You Down a lot. And it goes on for only two minutes. I would have rather have heard Hunt You Down for as a three, four minute song. It's the kind of thing, you know, Paul does these medleys. I'm not just thinking about Red Rose Speedway, the medley there, or what he did on Memory Almost Full, but some of these shorter ones, like on the first McCartney album. And this kind of reminds me of it. And C-Link, I love hearing him playing lead guitar, which is, you know, it's it's something I really treasure. Because one of the my favorite things whenever I see Paul live is watching him play lead guitar, which he doesn't do all that much. I mean, on on the end... You know, the jamming at the end, he does it, and a little bit on Let Me Roll It, and maybe a few songs here and there. But for the most part, you don't really see Paul play lead guitar too much. And he, he's talked about what a privilege it is to play lead guitar. Do more of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard him say that C-Link, the full version, is 11 minutes long. Wow. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind hearing that. Maybe that'll be on... Uh... <laughs> the deluxe version. <laughs> uh, that would be uh, ideal for the deluxe version, something like that. Yeah. Um, also, I would like to say that this album reminds me most of all of Chaos and Creation in the Backyard with a little bit of RAM. Um, and the reason why I mentioned Chaos and Creation is because that album really stands out as an album that was not really very produced. It was much more simple in its production much more raw you know sometimes people don't like when paul's albums when when it's overdone in the production when it's too layered you know i would never be critical of an album like tug of war which i think was impeccably produced but some people don't like full-blown productions um sometimes you might think some of the songs are overdone and a lot of people love chaos and creation in the backyard because it was it reminded you more of the if you forgive the term alan pure McCartney sound, <laughs> more organic sound. And I think this album reminds me more of that. It has very much a McCartney in the 2000s feel to it. And you can sometimes think of certain songs from the other albums he's done in the 2000s. Like, for example, Happy With You kind of reminds me, and this is kind of strange to say, with... Um, one of the songs from Memory Almost Full, You Tell Me. Because he talks about, in, in Happy With You, some of the simple things in life that make him happy. And, for example, like, um, what was it? Uh, uh, seeing a cardinal in a tree. This is in, in actually in You Tell Me. He brings up a cardinal in a tree and butterflies. And so, Happy With You, he brings up things in nature and the sound of babies' laughter and things like that. The very simple, basic things in life that can make you happy. So, lyrically, um, you know, kind of reminds me of You Told Me in that regard. And and certain songs like, like Caesar Rock, the, the goofiness of it will bring back something like Smile Away. Um, so, it has sort of a Ram-like quality to it, as does um, Hunt You Down. The only thing that I don't like that Paul has done in recent years, and whether this is because of his voice, I don't know. I never like when you screw around with his voice too much, when it's distant from the microphone, or in the case of Hunt You Down, where it's distorted. And maybe it works that way. I'd much rather hear his pure voice, faults and all, singing some of these songs. You know, there are certain songs on new, like Appreciate, where I, I don't like the way his voice sounds. I love the song. I just don't like what was done with his voice. And Hunt You Down is like that, though I love Hunt You Down as a rocker. But overall, with only a few days to listen to this album, you know, I think it's very strong. But, you know, like we've been saying, come back in a month or two months, and we'll probably have a more accurate reading of, of how we really feel. So very quickly, I think we should bring up the Grand Central concert, maybe just summarize yeah, Darren it. was going to say something else about the album. I okay, no, no, go ahead. I I was uh, probably just going to repeat what I've said early on. You know, uh, it's very important that this, this, this is this album, like I, I like I mentioned earlier on, uh, I think lyrically 
overall, you can make the general observation that it is a, uh, it's a rather simple album. There's not a lot of depth lyrically on the album, except for things like Despite Repeated Warnings, but yet at the same time, and the titles of the songs, for the most part, Simple, Do It Now, Come On To Me, For You, which is for you. Um, <laughs> but yet there is, as we discuss it, I realize, a lot going on in here. And it is very difficult, this album, to sum it up quickly, because as you just pointed out, Ken, it has similarities to Chaos and Creation in the Backyard. And yet I heard an album that sort of reminded me a little of London Town or Driving Rain in that it was a lot of little detours and musical jumping from, you know, texture to texture and tempo to tempo. So it, it bears additional dissection uh, for an album that on, on the surface came off to me as being very simple. It isn't really when you dig in there and take into consideration the music, the production, the fact that he, in, within one album he has a song called Do It Now, but then there's also Despite Repeated Warnings. Mm -hmm. So, And uh, the general con consensus I've picked up mainly from initial opinions on Facebook is that everybody sort of has different and varying opinions of it. Some love it, some don't get it, and I bet you the ones that don't get it will have a different uh, view in a month or two. Well, let's hope that they take the time to listen to it. Yeah, it's it's an interesting album, and it's well worth... Uh, 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 it fits nicely, and it's a, a, a worthy addition to McCartney's catalog. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Alan? I don't have anything else to say about the music, but does the cover remind you a bit of Gontrapo? People were saying that, yeah, because of... Uh... You know, um, all the, the different colors and yeah, it, it's very reminiscent of, of God. It, it does say some of it actually, it says in the liner notes that it comes from Egypt Station and Egypt Station 2, that there was actually two paintings that Paul did at one point, whether or not they are exact replicas or Paul cut and pasted parts of these. I haven't seen the original paintings that he did. Uh, I didn't know there were two of them. I thought it was just one Egypt station. Hmm. But but according to the notes, it refers to Egypt station two. So in that regard, it's sort of uh, got a cut and paste uh, artistic uh, similarity to Ram. Hmm. You know, okay. Ram's artwork, which was very much like, a, you know, a school project kind of thing with glue, glitter, markers and, <laughs> you know. This ha kind of has that, but it's colorful like Gon Trapa. That's a, that's a good uh, good point. Yeah. Okay. Um, one song we just didn't mention at all between the three of us is People Want Peace. Anyone want to give their opinion of the song? Yeah, I will. Uh, when I saw People Got Peace, I thought, oh, no, it's peace in the neighborhood and mm -hmm. come on, people again. Mm -hmm. uh, those very simple... Uh, message songs that don't have much substance to them. Come On People is one of the tunes that always made me roll my eyes uh, from McCartney's catalog. Uh, <laughs> let's go, Come On People. Paul, I'm not feeling very motivated by that little, you know, that doesn't, Come On People, I'm not motivated. It didn't <laughs> work. And I kind of sort of approached People Want Peace in the same way. But it's a little. It, there is a little more substance to it than the title, as I put here in my notes about a people. Want, people want peace. It's got more substance than "Come on, people," and it's got much more substance than "Freedom." It's a throwaway, but it's a good throwaway. You know, I'd rather have it than not. Hmm. Okay, Alan. Well, I think if we don't hassle John for his peace songs and we don't hassle Ringo for saying peace and love all the time we might as well give Paul a pass on this one you know? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean it's a sentiment you can't really argue with um, right. but and and, and uh, actually you know I, I kind of approach it 
like Darren thinking immediately of peace in the neighborhood and come on people. Um, but I, but I also felt that there was a bit more to it here. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's an okay song. It's not one of the, I think, best songs on here, but, but it's all right. Yeah. I think it's a fairly simple song, but I love the, I love the, uh, the different um, the, the blend of the of the percussion that's used the heavy percussion and the keyboards you know the musicality of it all and, and the arrangement you know which uh, I do believe throughout this entire album the arrangements are just superb mm-hmm. you know so um, yeah and I also you think of peace songs you got to think of pipes of peace as well oh right yeah. yeah. All right, very quickly, before we end the show, uh, we have to talk about that uh, concert that Paul gave at Grand Central and um, and what we thought about it. Darren, you want to offer your, your opinion? Uh, I, I saw parts of it. Um, I was not home when it was supposed to begin at 8. A friend of mine contacted me, texted me, and asked me if I knew anything about a delay, why the, why it hadn't started yet. And I didn't know what he was talking about, but I guess it was just a case where you go to a concert that has eight o'clock on the ticket and the show begins at 10 after or a quarter after eight. Uh, 8.30, actually. He started at 8.30. Yeah, it was a half an hour. And so I picked up a few songs in. I initially had it in the car where I could listen to the audio. Obviously, I did not watch my phone while driving. Mm -hmm. Uh so I was listening to the audio, and but I, it, I did have to leave it at some point later on because I was a little disappointed. No, I wasn't a little. I was very disappointed with the way Paul's voice sounded, and it seemed as though it was getting worse as the show went. But then I read something, a comment of a person on Facebook who said, listen, it was not a traditional concert venue. It was a hall. It was part of a hall in Grand Central. Mm-hmm. Not conducive to music, especially not rock music. And with a, a rock band playing, when you're on stage, that's a lot different than singing quietly to yourself in the car. Paul probably wore his voice down, competing with echo, reverb, you know. It was starting to become difficult to follow. And when he went into back in the USSR, I left the show. And then went back and caught the very end of it and was surprised he didn't do Hey Jude, but... He didn't do Hey Jude, did he? No, he didn't. Ex- no, okay, good. Except for three I mean, seconds really, in the intro. <laughs> it, might have, it might have been in part when I walked away from it. So, I mean, but nobody seemed to care. He could have went on stage and went for, for an hour, and no one would have cared. So I kind of felt like maybe I was nitpicking a little bit, but it, it was bothering me a bit, the condition of his voice, especially as the show went along. Hmm. Okay. How about you, Alan? Um, yeah, towards the end of the show, his voice really was getting a bit ragged, which didn't surprise me. He was getting a little bit out of tune, actually, in, uh, you know, the the Abbey Road medley at the end. Uh, but for most of the show, I thought he sounded actually pretty good. I think uh, we should mention, as he pointed out in the show, that Giles Martin did the sound for that show. Uh, mm-hmm. And... While, yeah, I suppose playing with a rock band in Vanderbilt Hall would be kind of echoey, uh, the sound that came through to us, I thought was quite good. Um, I thought it was an, you know, I, I kind of like him best in these little venues. I mean, I saw him at the High Line. I saw him in, uh, you know, up close, that thing it, it, that he did in... Um, you know, for MTV. Yeah, it's a love theater. Yeah. Um, and I saw him at the Cavern when he did that show in 99. And those shows, without all of the big production stuff going on, I, I just like those the best. It's just him and the band playing. Um, so it was maybe half the length of his normal show. Um, I didn't mind at all that Hey Jude wasn't there. I, I think that could use maybe uh, one or two tours rest at this point. One thing I, I watched, I watched it actually twice. And uh, one thing that really struck me that 
I kind of liked, um, because it wasn't a song that is a favorite of mine, is the new arrangement he did for My Valentine, where the whole band played acoustic guitars and Wicks played accordion, and he sang it through a megaphone giving it that sort of 1920 sound. I was thinking of that, actually, Ken, when you were talking about not liking what's done with his voice uh, uh -huh. on, at certain points on albums. Um, I thought it worked. Um, I'm not sure I would have thought it worked if it was the only version of My Valentine I'd heard. I mean, we, we have the original to sort of bounce off the memory of as we listen to this, but I kind of liked the idea that he changed it up a lot. And I, I, I thought, in a way, that was one of the highlights of the show. Uh, Love Me Do and uh, From Me to You, I thought, were, were kind of nice, too, going back to the really early Beatles stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised he only played, what, two or three songs from the new album. Three. Three, yeah. Yeah. It would have been good to hear some of the others, and I think if he had played some of the others that, you know, I've... I'm still sort of shrugging at, uh, you know, maybe as with, um, you know, as Darren said, with uh, Who Cares, uh, maybe hearing it live would have uh, helped it turn a corner or something for me. But, I, you know, I, I found it an enjoyable show. Uh, I have uh, someone ripped the audio separately and split the tracks. I think that's something I might listen to now and then. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think it's, I thought, I, I, I kind of like the idea that he did it as well. Uh, you know, it was a, it was a, look, he's, he's obviously trying to do everything he can to get publicity for this album. And this was a really good way to do it, presenting a 90 minute concert free to everybody on YouTube. So, yeah. One yeah. thing he's good at is staging events. Oh yeah. <laughs> That, uh, you know, will get a lot of publicity. And speaking of it, we, we didn't mention the Jimmy Fallon appearance too. Yeah. Where he played, you know, one song only. But I think the other stuff that went on, I, I thought was a lot of fun, like the elevator gimmick. You know? That was very funny. Mm -hmm. that, that was funny, you know. So, I, and I'm, I take this like this whole weekend of stuff. I mean, the album release, the show, the Fallon appearance. I, I sort of am taking it all as one whole thing, you know, like a, a big mega event of Egypt Station. Right. So that's how I'm looking yeah. at it. Yeah, I enjoyed the concert. Um, you know, I just love the fact that he stages these things that it it's the kind of thing that he's only going to do once in his lifetime. You know, kind of like when he was on David Letterman's show and he played on top of the marquee similar to the rooftop. You know, doing things like that, Paul is so good at that. And um Yes, I can dwell on his voice, and I know some people probably don't want to hear it anymore. But, um, you know, when you treasure that voice that you know is one of the greatest voices of all time, you also, you know, you got to give him a break because he is 76 years old. You can't expect him to sound like he used to. And some of the songs that he does are vocally demanding. I was really surprised that he went into the middle of the audience there for Blackbird. Mm -hmm. But maybe he just wants to give that image of, you know, He's just a regular guy, just like the rest of us. He's going to hang out with us, you know. So um, I love the fact that he did that. I didn't really get the whole thing about my Valentine. I mean, my Valentine is is a really beautiful ballad. It's not like a honey pie type song where you might want to use a megaphone, you know, or or a when I'm sixty four. Or, or you gave me the answer type song. It, it's not a dance hall type song to me. Maybe that's why he did that. But I, I do like the whole acoustic guitar arrangement behind that. I love the fact that he played High, High, High so early in the set list. That's usually played towards the end of one of his concerts. And one of the biggest highlights for me was Letting Go, mm -hmm. which is one of those songs that there are certain songs that McCartney has done where for some reason, they work better live as live songs than on the studio versions. And I love the studio version from Venus and Mars, don't get me wrong. But Letting Go from Wings Over America is one of the greatest, you know, live recordings from any of the Beatles, as far as I'm concerned. And um, the fact that he's brought the song back in the last few years uh, into, into his concerts. And he did this with having a horn section that did a solo at the end, that played their parts alone, without the band. 
I mean, how cool was that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a nice touch right there. Yeah. Um, and he did uh, perform for me to you, which uh, he first did at the, uh, the Lipa event where his band did a, a show that was something like an hour with a lot of acoustic songs in there. And that was the first time he ever did for me to you in his solo career. Those are highlights for me when there are songs that he's never done live or ha haven't done live for a long time. But the set list, aside from the songs on the new album, is pretty much the same. And, you know, my only complaint, and this is something that, you know, I'll probably get some heat for because there are people who will say, you know, ease up on him. He doesn't have to be doing this. And I agree with that. But when you've got a catalog as rich as Paul McCartney's, I just wish he'd shake up his set list a lot more and do a lot of songs that he's never done live before. And if he's worried about holding on to an audience that may not know some of his solo stuff, he could do a lot of hits that he's never done live before, from Uncle Albert to uh, Take It Away or Hell and Wheels or those songs, which would work very well live. Hey, you got a horn section there. You could do Take It Away, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, we've said this many times on the show with, with Steve and when Al was on, and that's my only complaint. If it wasn't for the fact that I thought so highly of his catalog, I wouldn't be saying that. But um, I wish he would give a rest to some of the Beatles stuff that he's done so many times over, which I'm sure he feels he has to do. But at the same time, he also knows that these songs are gems and they touch people's lives and they're very special and he's, he's only too proud to do them. He's very much moved by seeing reactions from people in the audience, especially when they cry or when certain songs have affected people in their lives. And he's talked about that in his interviews. So for that reason, he's probably always going to be doing these, these classics. But when you consider how much great music he's never done live before, you know, I wish that he would put more of that into the set list. But then again, this is a free show. How can you complain about anything? It's a free concert. You can stream it. I was very surprised, by the way, that there was no buffering when I was watching this concert. Usually when oh, you see live events, I didn't really have any problems with it. Oh, I buffered once. Okay. But that's still better than, than, uh, than some things. But there was one little buffer in there. Okay. But uh, that, that also could have been just, you know, where I was at the point in the car. But... Uh, What's good about a, a program like ours, like these discussion that we're having is that and, uh, you know, while I'm listening to the two of you talk, I'm a listener. I'm not uh -huh. a co-host. Uh, I will now go back uh, this evening, perhaps or tomorrow and watch the entire concert and be a little less reactionary to being uh, a, a hardcore fan who just can't deal with seeing his hero uh, struggle to sing but now i have a different perspective and uh you know and we'll listen with a different ear well i'm going to be listening with the same ears but a different approach and uh, that's what i think is good about these discussions and hopefully folks who've listened uh will maybe take away a different opinion of songs on egypt station or the concert itself mm. by the way did you guys hear about who was in the audience for that show? Meryl Streep. Uh -huh. I heard. And, and Jimmy Fallon, you mentioned. Well, Jimmy Fallon was there. He actually, I did see him on camera at one mm -hmm. point. I Chris Rock. Who, yeah. Chris Rock. I could tell you who wasn't in the audience. Us. Yeah. We weren't there. <laughs> I was trying hard during the week to get some information, squeeze some info out of folks, but there was none to be squeezed. Right. They were supposed to go to mainly Spotify subscribers. Right. And there was also a con contest that Lyft did. Uh -huh. L-Y-F-T. I guess like, an, like Uber. But Lyft was doing something, I think, if you downloaded their app, um, something to that effect. Um, okay. You know. Just to run down the list real quick, Amy Schumer was there, John Bon Jovi, Greg Kirsten was there, Kendall Jenner. And Sean Lennon was in the audience. Oh, wow. I, didn't, I didn't see him. Uh, Steve Buscemi was there, too. Am I forgetting anybody? I think that's it. Well, Nancy was there, his wife, because he sang My Valentine. And actually, right next to Nancy was Arthur. Paul's oh, really? Yeah. That's Mary's son, by the way. So uh, in good company right there. I wonder if Paul knew that Sean was there. I'm sure. 
Okay. It makes sense because Sean was at the Lennon Stamp event earlier in the afternoon. And sure. So. Okay. Well, that puts the show to a close. This ran rather lengthy, didn't it? <laughs> but for a good reason. Anyway, so if any of you would like to get in contact with us, let's run down our contact information, starting with starting with Darren. Probably the best way to reach out to me is uh, through, I have two Facebook pages, but the one I, I tend to tell folks who listen to me at WFUV, and for those of you listening here, go to the Facebook page that is Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio, which is more music and sometimes, you know, personal stuff like sports, uh, but mainly music and, and WFUV or, or radio centric. Uh, so that's Darren DeVivo on WFU. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Darren. Yeah. Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio is that Facebook page. Uh, I'm on Instagram, but I don't really do anything on it, at least not now. If I ever kind of get uh, Instagram and or my Twitter account going, I'll share the information then. But for now, uh, Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio on Facebook. Okay, Alan. Okay, the easiest way to get to me is also through Facebook, and I also have two pages. There's just plain old Alan Cozen. That one is mostly reviews, things I've written. Sometimes I'll put a Beatles-related thing on there. Uh, more of the Beatles-related stuff goes on to Alan Cozen Remixed, which is my other one. Ken? All right. Well, before I give my contact information, um, you can always reach us, all of us, at our email address, which is Things We Said Today Radio Show. We also have our own Facebook page, which is Things We Said Today Radio Fans. Beatles Radio Fans. <laughs> Good old Steve set up this really complicated page name. <laughs> And a very long email address, too. Thank you, Steve. Um, <laughs> things we said today, Beatles radio fans. And you can contact me at everylittlething at att.net. That's the name of my syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. You can contact me through my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, through the contact page. Don't forget, it still remains. I've got Beatles trivia and Beatle games every single week where you can win one out of nine great prizes, whether they're books, CDs, DVDs. It's all right there on the website, plus loads of interviews with people in the Beatle world, even interviews with people like Steve and Alan and Al before they were even part of things we said today. Mm -hmm. It's all right there on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Can I chime in one quick thing? Sure. I should have mentioned before. If you want to shoot me an email, Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org, and it's uh, D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O. So that's if you, if you prefer email and you don't do the Facebook thing, should anyone want to send me, you know, that's the email address. And also, one quick thing, since I mentioned it earlier, if you want to join the Facebook page for the other show that I'll be a part of, Talk More Talk, just go to the Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, and, uh, you know, like us, and watch the new show. It's going to be exciting. All right, so this has been great. And for Alan Cozen and Darren DeVivo, great job, Darren, for your first show back. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.